In this video, we're going to talk about the Mavic 3 Cinema. You know, the one with the three cameras. We're going to talk about settings, camera settings, and all the stuff that you need to know to take amazing footage with this drone. However, we're going to start with Remote ID. Let's get to it. When it comes to Remote ID, one of the first things we need to do is go to the FAA website and see if our drone is capable of transmitting Remote ID information. So in here I have Google open. All I'm going to do is type some stuff. Is my drone capable of remote ID? Does my drone have remote ID? And we are going to go to this website, UIS Remote Identification. It tells you what remote ID is and all that good stuff. And uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to see if our drone has remote ID. So let's go to the UAS Declaration of Compliance system. See it down here? The website for this is UASDOC, DOC for Declaration of Compliance. So UASDOC.FAA.com. Gov. In here, go ahead and click on View Public DOC List. And we are going to search. We're going to search for the Mavic. And here is the Mavic Pro Cine. Let's go ahead and click on View. And you can do this in any of the drones. Make sure that it's capable of transmitting remote ID information. Click on View. And here we go. If the serial number starts with 1581F6MK, then from 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 to ZZZZZ, so any serial number that starts with that will be okay. Now, notice how many characters it has. I believe it's 20. Make sure that yours also has that many uh, characters. Now let's go into here and let's see if we have it. Click on the three dots, click on about, and uh, you can see the name. I just named mine Cine Lou. The Wi-Fi named the same thing, so the Mavic 3 Pro app version. Look at the aircraft firmware. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check for updates. So my firmware is up to date. Now let's go to the aircraft serial number and the flight controller serial number. Notice that it doesn't say remote ID serial number. All it's giving me is the aircraft serial number and the flight controller serial number. And in this case, they have to be one and the same. I want you to notice that it starts with the numbers 1581F6MK, which is what we have here. What that tells me is that this aircraft is actually equipped to transmit the remote ID. Okay, so we are good. And the number that we need to tell the FAA for the remote ID serial number is the flight controller serial number. And the reason for that is because this drone doesn't have something that says remote ID serial number. And when that happens, it's because this, the flight controller serial number is going to be the same as the remote ID serial number. So let's go ahead and exit out of here. And now click on the top left of your smart controller, and that should open a new menu. And this is what you need to look at, remote ID functionality normal. So we're good. Remote ID functionality normal. All right. Now we need to register our drone and we need to tell the FAA what the remote ID serial number is. For that, you go to the drone zone. They've changed the interface a little bit. No problem. Log in. 
agree. Launch drone owners and pilots dashboard. And you're going to see a list of the drones that I have. Click on manage device inventory. And now I'm going to look for my already registered Mavic 3 Cine. I already gave it the remote ID information, but if you haven't, all you have to do is click on these three dots to the right, go to edit, and when this edit the device comes up and it asks you, does your drone broadcast FAA remote ID information? Tell it yes. Tell it the standard remote ID, because this is not a module that we bought. This comes integrated with the drone. The manufacturer will be DJI. The model is Mavic 3 Cine. Whatever nickname you want to give it, I gave mine Cine Lou. And the remote ID serial number. Click on Save, and you are done. You are good to go. Now, let's talk about some of the settings that we have here. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to address whether we are taking pictures or video. Right now, you see this icon here that tells me that it is video. I can click on there and then I can choose photo instead of video. Notice that we also have master shots, quick shots, hyperlapses, and pano. I'm not going to discuss that. I'm going to discuss only the photo and the video. So let's start with the photo. We can do single, we can do explore, we can do uh, uh, auto exposure bracket. And if we choose that, it's going to ask us whether we want to do three shots or five shots. I usually just leave it at three if I need to. So this is when the camera takes three shots in the same position at different exposures, and then you can put them together using software, and it's going to give you an optimal uh, exposure of your image. We don't want that right now, so I just want single. But notice we could also have a burst. If we choose burst, it's going to ask us, do we want three, five, or seven? We can also do a timed shot. So, you know, wait three seconds, wait five seconds, wait seven seconds, or even 10, 15, 20 seconds, something like that. So I'm just going to leave it in single. So we are in photo and single. I'm going to click out of there. Notice that I am in the one X and I am using pro. See down here where it says pro? You can click on that and then it goes directly to auto. Click to go to pro click to go to auto. This is auto now. If I click on this side, I can change from JPEG to RAW to JPEG and RAW. I rarely do that. I only do that when I need to deliver the JPEGs to the clients right away. Otherwise, I'm shooting only in RAW. And quite frankly, I don't like auto too much. So let's go to Pro and now let's click on the settings. White balance, you can leave it at auto. I rarely do. I usually use Kelvin, the sliding scale, you know, so we can have it at more, we can have it at less. See how that's super warm, that is super cold. So I'm gonna leave it at around 52, 5300. The format, we already talked about this. Aspect ratio can be 69 or 43. I'm gonna leave it at 69. This is going to give you a 20 megapixel image. Remember, we're using this camera. So the One X, that's what we're using. So the storage can go either in the built-in SSD drive or on the micro SD card. Either way, you know, I, I think I'm going to have it go to the micro SD card just in case. And there you go. See these settings? There's also exposure settings. The ISO can be set to auto. I rarely do that. There are exceptions. The shutter speed, right? Auto or manual. The aperture. This will go from 2.8 all the way to 11. So that is with photo using the One X camera. 
let's go ahead and use the three camera. See, it immediately zooms in. I'm going to go to Pro again and same thing, 69. But this time it can give me 48 megapixels, 48 megapixels. Look at that. That's amazing. Let me go to the exposure settings and I need to um, close this a little bit. And you see how there are some things that are out of focus and all of that. But see how I can go into autofocus. I can then just click on the parts that I want to keep in focus. Of course, these things now here in my studio are a little bit too close. So it can't really focus very, very well. Anyway, so autofocus is good, but remember you can just tap in what you need and there you have it. Now let's go to the 7X and here we go. Again, this is set to auto. I like to set it at pro and now let's go to the settings. The ISO, I, I like to have it um, um, manual. So the shutter, and now if we go to the settings, I want you to notice that the resolution is gonna be 12 megapixel, 12 megapixel. Again, I can choose where I want for the storage to go. If it's to the SSD drive, so see it even says SSD, or to the micro SD card. All right, so same things, JPEG, RAW, or JPEG and RAW 69, and all of that good stuff. Now let's switch to the settings for video. So I'm going to click here and tell it that I want video. And this is going to give me more choices. So if I click again, I can go from auto to pro. I'm going to go to the one X. So this is the Hasselblad camera. And uh, this is the one that is going to give me the most options. So here we go. Look at the resolution and the frames per second. I can have 4K, I can have 5.1K, I can be at 30 frames per second, at 25 per frames per second, 24. I can go all the way to 60 frames per second. Notice the differences here. If I switch to H265, so that's going to give me 10 bit color now, I can still go at 60 frames per second if I am at 4K. Look what happens when I go to ProRes. It gives me a warning. It says, hey, wait a minute. If you're going to save to ProRes, then you have to switch to the SSD. You see the micro SD card is not fast enough to save the ProRes codec in video. So let's go ahead and switch and it automatically switches to the SSD. There it is. And look at the differences here. I can go at 60 frames per second at 5.1K. I can go at 50 frames per second only. So I'm gonna stay at 4K. And now I can do high dynamic range, D-log, so that would be logarithmic, or D-log M. Now, if I switch to D-Log, let me just make you aware of this, and you go to the exposure, you cannot have an ISO lower than 400. So listen, raising the ISO is not an issue, and changing it to 400 is not a big deal, especially in this camera. It doesn't introduce a lot of noise, so it's perfectly fine. But if you really don't want to raise it to 400, maybe you don't have an ND filter, you just can't, then I suggest that you go to D-Log M. It's, it's, it's not as good in my opinion. This is just my opinion. This is not fact. For me, it's not as good, but when you go to the exposure, you will be able to lower the ISO to 100 if you need to. So for this, I'm just going to leave it at D-Log. And now notice that I'm going to ProRes. And I have three different flavors of ProRes that I can choose from. 422LT, 422, or 422HQ. I have yet to find an occasion in which 422HQ wasn't good enough. 
So I've done movies, I've done documentaries, I've worked for Nat Geo, Disney, HBO, etc., etc., and all of them have accepted 422HQ. So 422HQ, if you want the highest quality, that's going to make the file size slightly bigger. And for most things, just so that you know, if you do need ProRes, for most things, 422LT will be more than good enough. Having said that, communication is key. Always ask your client. If they don't know, talk to their editor. Talk to whomever is going to be putting this video together. Because if they are requiring ProRes, that means it's a higher level than something that requires only an MP4 or even an H.265. So here we go. It's going to save us MOV. And there you go. If you switch to H.265, then you have other choices. Notice that the format is going to be MP4. You can switch back to 60 frames per second with a D-log. If you switch to normal, then when you go to the exposure, there you go. You can switch the ISO again. So let's go ahead and switch cameras to the 3X. And this is what we have now. We can only shoot in 4K. Notice that we can only choose in D log M. This is if we are in ProRes. If we uh, switch to H265, then we can go down to 1080p. And the same uh, 60 frames per second is the fastest that we can record this at. All right. So, Again, if you are going to choose uh, to shoot in logarithmic, and that is my preferred way of shooting, uh, you only have the D log here as an option. I don't like it as much as the log, but hey, you know what? It's better than normal. It's better than the, the Rec. 709. And if you go to the exposure, of course, you can go to your 100 ISO. Now, you won't be able to choose ProRes from here, only H.265. Let's go ahead and switch to the 7X. And same thing, we're going to go to the Pro. And for this one, you can switch to ProRes, which immediately will switch to MOV. And you can change the frames per second up until uh, 60 frames per second. You can go lower and it's going to give you 4K only. All right, so only 4K. As with the other cameras, you can go 422LT, 422 and 422HQ. Notice that the color is only normal here. You can only shoot in Rec. 709. So I'm going to go back to my 1X camera. Again, that's the Hasselblad. And I'm going to go back here and I'm going to change some things. I like the D log, even if that changes uh, things. I want to change this back to uh, 4K so that I can switch to ProRes. All right. So remember, if you switch to less than uh, 4K, or you need to switch to less than 4K, change it to H.264 or H.265, and then you can go down all the way to 1080. Depending on what you choose, you'll get different options. Again, I want to go back to my uh, 4K, so C, 4K, and I'm going to switch to ProRes, and for my purposes, I will be shooting in 422HQ. D log is good, even if it leaves my ISO at 400. Let's go to other settings. Safety. So the first thing that this is talking about is the obstacle avoidance system. And it's asking you, hey, what do you want the drone to do if it, quote unquote, sees or detects? an obstacle. Remember, it doesn't really work with thin wires and that sort of thing. Okay, so be very careful. Visual line of sight always. So here we go. You could bypass it. So it like curves and goes around it. 
you want to shut it off, you know, you could say, hey, no obstacle avoidance. There you go. Yeah, nah, not me. The, the drone is a little too new. Or do you want it to break? That is my favorite course of action to just break, just stop. You can have it display a radar map or not. Do you want to have optimal uh, return home or a preset return home? meaning to this altitude and all of that good stuff. I usually choose optimal for this. This is uh, newer, uh, so some of my older drones don't have it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, flying in an optimal uh, return home, inadequate lighting, it's going to be a little bit safer than not. You can update the home point like if you move, right? Like you, you're walking around, you know? Update the home point. You just go here, click here, and update it. This is the maximum altitude, maximum distance. You can change this or not change this. You know, I gotta tell you, I usually leave it at the max altitude, and it's not because I'm gonna break all the regulations, I'm gonna fly above 400 feet, blah, blah, blah. The reason why I do it is safety. You know, sometimes, sometimes, to avoid an obstacle, you actually have to go up to avoid an accident, to avoid a disaster. And sometimes, yes, you need to break that regulation. Don't forget, that's still okay. If you're breaking the regulation because of safety considerations, it's okay, you're allowed to do that as the pilot in command. You just need, if requested, remember, if requested, all you need to do is send the FAA a written explanation on why you deviated from the regulations. All right, so that's in the part 107. This is where you would calibrate the compass. This is where you would calibrate the IMU. That's the computer. This is battery info. So look at this, battery cycle count zero. <laughs> this battery is brand new. That's because I just got the drone yesterday. So yeah, everything is brand new. I'm playing with a new toy. Auxiliary LEDs, they will turn on automatically or off or on the whole time. The same with the front arm LEDs, on or auto. If you were going to be flying in a, in a flight restricted area or in a controlled area, you're going to have to go to the unlock geo zone, and that's when you go to the, um, the DJI uh, unlock, and you unlock it, uh, and then you would have to go and be connected to the internet, and then download those unlock certificates. They would appear here, and then you can turn them on and off. Find my drone is absolutely fantastic. So you can see where I am right in there. And advanced safety settings, the send, hover, what? I usually have it at return home. I want it back home. Yeah, if you lose contact with a drone, yeah, come back to me. I can, I can stop the propellers in an emergency by just going down and in with both sticks or down and out with both sticks. That's kind of important. All right, AirSense is fairly new to me. And uh, according to what this says is that if this is on and there's manned aircraft nearby, then DJI will tell us. That is of course provided that we're connected to the internet. And I don't see why not. I mean, I can connect the controller to the hotspot on my phone and that way I'm always connected. The next thing that we have is control. Here is where you can change the units from metric, uh, meters, kilometers, or imperial. I have it at imperial because we are in the US and that's what we use here. Subject scanning, uh, when enabled, the aircraft will automatically scan and display subjects in the camera view. And you know, this is only available for single shot photos and normal video recordings, so I'm not gonna turn that on. Gain and Expo Tuning, this is where you can tell the aircraft to slow down, say, the, the, the tilt or, or the, even the pan of the gimbal. And uh, you can change it from Cine mode, you can change the settings, normal, 
that's when the remote is set to N. The cine mode is when the remote is set to C. And then sports is for when the remote is set to S. So there's a switch right here in the controller, and that's where you would switch uh, from going to C to N to S. So most of the time I have it in N or normal, but once I want those tripod or cinematic shots, I change it to C, but not too much because it slows the drone down a lot. So if you gun it or whatever, it's not going to, to really go. And then sports mode, which shuts down all of the uh, uh, obstacle avoidance sensors. Uh, so it's not my preferred way either, but it does make the drone much peppier. I gotta tell you, I uh, use so many different drones from different manufacturers that I'm actually pretty good at controlling those things even with my fingers, so I rarely go here. Now, there are occasions in which no matter how hard I try, I can't really get the smoothness that I need with my fingers. That's when I actually go here and then I start playing around with these so that I slow the, say, the, the, the tilt of the gimbal down or the speed of the drone and that sort of thing, so it allows for much smoother motion. All right, so let's keep on going. Uh, you can calibrate the gimbal. I'm not gonna do this now. Uh, I have all of my drones set to remote, uh, to mode two. That is where the left stick goes up, down, and yaws, right? And the right stick goes forward, goes backward, goes to the left and to the right. So that's what I'm used to. Uh, some people are used to different modes, um, but most pilots I know are set to mode two. So be very careful when flying somebody else's drone because it might not be set to mode two. And that happened to me once. Uh, I borrowed somebody else's drone and, and the sticks were reversed. So instead of going up and down and the yaw with the left hand, which is what mode two is, he had it set to the right hand and oh, it's a miracle I didn't crash that drone. So same with the RC calibration. So the RC is remote controller. And of course, there's a flight tutorial that we're not going to go over, but you can repair to the aircraft if you need to. So this is where you would do that. And now we should talk about button customization. So in, in the uh, RC, in the remote controller, you have dials, you have buttons, you have some buttons here, you have some here, right? So if you click where it says button customization, you will be able to tell the controller what you want for these things to do. So click here, and now you will be able to set the C1, the C2 to whatever you want. Look how I have them set up. I have the C1 button to recenter and tilt down the, the gimbal, the C2 button to the camera settings, uh, the C3 button, I have it to auxiliary light, uh, and then you have a five directional button called 5D that has five different positions. So if you go up, it does one thing, down, left, right, and of course you can just press it in the middle. So th this is how I have it set up. Um, this is a very personal thing. I have the right dial to adjust aperture. I have the, the, the C1 button on the right dial to adjust the shutter speed. Uh, listen, again, set these the way that you want them to. Um, it, whatever I have is uh, really irrelevant for you. This is what's comfortable for me, but you may uh, want to use something else. Camera, these are the settings that we already talked about. Notice that we're set to ProRes, HQ. I can have video subtitles on or off. That's irrelevant, I'm not gonna need it. I have the anti-flicker set to 60 Hertz. And that's because I'm going to be shooting at 30 frames per second and the Hertz, so the refresh rate, should be a multiple of your frames per second. So just either leave it at automatic or set it appropriately, otherwise your video is not going to look correct. This one is kind of important, the peaking level, the peaking level. So the peaking level does this. It actually puts a red outline on the things that are in focus or contrasty enough. Uh, so you don't have to guess if something is in focus. I see a lot of people like going close to the screen, oh, is this in focus and all of that. Uh, it works on manual focus. 
um, and I usually leave it on. That's my preference. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm saying this is my preference because then I don't have to guess. I don't have to just go, oh, was this in focus or not? I can see the lines. So it's a fairly easy thing for me to do and I usually put it in high. So I usually leave it on the whole time. Uh, the histogram here is what I have on here. So uh, I may have a future lesson on just the histogram and what it means and how you can use it to your advantage. And for me, the most important thing, and I can just tell you right now, is you see this signal here, how it's going a little bit to the left. That means that it's a little bit darker, but notice that it's not touching the other left, meaning it's not crushing my luma values. And that's what the histogram is measuring. It's measuring the luma values, so the brightness and contrast. And uh, the signal, if it's uh, a lot to the left, that means that your image is dark. If it's a lot to the right, then it means that your image is bright. And if you see the lines kind of sort of being smooshed or crushed on the left or on the right, that means that you have pixels that are either underexposed, if they're left, of, or, or overexposed, if they are to the right. So the best way to have the histogram is to have these uh, signal kind of sort of in the middle without anything being crushed. So nothing being all the way to the left or all the way to the right. And if you're using a very robust codec like ProRes 422HQ, you will be able to color correct it and it's going to look amazing. While if you crush the luminance, so either on the blacks or on the whites, then you won't be able to recuperate that. So always pay attention to the histogram and make sure that your video is exposed correctly. The overexposure warning is what we call the zebra lines. You're gonna see them as uh, um, diagonal uh, white and black lines. And this is your indication that something is either already overexposed or on its way to being overexposed. So it's a good idea to use this in combination with the histogram. Using the zebra lines or this overexposure warning is not going to be a substitute for using the histogram. Always have your histogram uh, uh, visible. Otherwise, it's very difficult for us to tell, especially in these small drone uh, um, uh, screens. Even the one of the smart controller, which is super bright. I mean, it's very small, right? It's hard for me to see. So I usually have both things on. I have the overexposure warning on and I have my histogram. And of course, we already talked about the peaking level. I also have that. So anything that's going to help me. The next thing that we have here is the grid lines. And in here you can have grid lines with a diagonal. You can have them with uh, the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds, of course, just means that anything of importance in your shot should be either on one of the lines or even better at one of the intersection uh, of the lines. Uh, like with everything in life, you know, learn the rules, love the rules, follow the rules until you're so familiar with them, you're so good with them that you can just go ahead and break every single one of them. Just make sure that if you do break uh, the rules uh, of the rule of thirds, right? I'm not talking about FAA rules, not those. I'm talking about cinematography rules. Uh, make sure that if you do break these, that you do so uh, with a reason, for a reason, because you want to communicate something for whatever. All right, so know what you're doing and then do whatever you know is best for your shot. Storage, same thing, internal storage, uh, because I'm going on ProRes, so it's using the SSD. I could switch to the SD card, but not while I am shooting in ProRes, because remember, that micro SD card, even though it's very fast, it's not fast enough to capture all the frames in video that we are uh, uh, capturing and therefore saving in ProRes, especially ProRes 422HQ. I could format either one of them. USB mode, uh, that is in case I want to connect the aircraft to the computer. You can custom name folders, custom name files, you can cache when recording. So all of those things you can do. And I usually leave the max video cache capability to uh, auto. Let's go to the next one, which is transmission. If I were live streaming, there you go, we would have to write in the RTMP information. So I'm gonna cancel out of this because we're not live streaming anything. Uh, HDMI output. You know, 
sometimes I do have the client right next to me or the director, producer, whatever, and they really need to see what the shot is looking like. Um, I don't want them uh, looking over my shoulder because it impedes my free movement. Sometimes they get a little bit too close. Um, but especially this controller, I mean, it has an HDMI out and I have a portable monitor that is battery powered. And so cable it, you know, a lot of people hate having the client right there. I love it. I love it because if the client is right there next to me as I'm shooting, they can't come later on and say, oh, you didn't get this shot or, oh, this wasn't, they can't because they saw it, they approved it and I am good. So some people get nervous. I don't. I am super happy having the client right there, the director right there, the producer right there, just making sure that we get exactly what they need. At the end of the day, the client needs to be happy. So it's not me, it's, it's whomever is paying the bill, all right? Let's go back uh, on transmission. The frequency, I usually have dual bands, so it's either 2.4 or 5.8, and it's gonna switch automatically. And it's the same with the channel mode. It's going to switch automatically. So this is just a radio transmission between the controller and the drone. And finally, we go to about, and we already talked about that. So next, we are going to fly so that you see these three cameras and their settings in action. Let's do it. Okay, so the drone itself comes in this really nice bag. And inside, you have the drone, you have chargers, you have the controller, batteries, and all of that good stuff. Now, taking the drone out, I really like this gimbal guard. Look how it works. It's doing the whole thing, so the top and the bottom, right? And it's actually keeping the propellers in, and that's kind of cool, see it? To get it out, to get it off, basically just put the drone like yay, pull on this thing, and it becomes loose. And now all we have to do is pull this off. And there you have it. That's the drone itself. So I'm going to put the drone on the table and we're going to launch from there. Right now it's uh, a little bit late. So it's later in the day. I'm not going to need any kind of ND filters or anything like that. So I'm going to put this away. And now I'm going to grab the controller. And this is what it looks like. For it to fit, in the case, we can't have the joysticks, see them? So they're missing, they're actually here in the back. We can just take them off and then screw them in. And then before putting the drone away, we just uh, take them back off. So it's not too bad. Let me go ahead and put this together and I'll start flying and uh, then I'll tell you what I'm doing. All right, so in here you see all the zebra lines. That's because I was exposed for the inside, and now I need to expose for the outside. Now let's go to the settings first. You know what, I think I'm gonna switch to 30 frames per second. D-Log is good, ProRes is good, MOV is good. Even though we have all of these zebra lines, look at the exposure. So, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna change this too much more. Maybe I'll bring it about yay. Well, I'm gonna change it to yay. Let's launch. It's asking me to check the propellers. So I will check the propellers and they are good. Check complete. And now let's launch. And take off. Let's go forward and up. I'm not going to take it too far away, but I do want to show you the different things that we have in here. So if I want to switch cameras, I would have to, to stop recording. Of course, I'm not recording, but I would have to stop recording if I were recording, switch, and there you go. I would have to then go into those settings. And just so that they match, I'm going to make it 4K. 30 frames per second, D-Log is good. And uh, I'm gonna 
go to ProRes, and there you have it. So you can see, you can see how this is uh, much different than before. So I'm actually going to go to the shutter, not set it at auto, but uh, maybe go a little bit faster. Maybe something like that. All right. If I want it yet to change to the 7X camera, just click on it. There you go. And in here, if you see the settings, the only color possible is normal. Even if you switch to H264 and H265, the only color possible is normal. So I'm going to go to ProRes. And uh, yeah, 422HQ is good. And the settings are good. So I'm going to go back to the 1X. And I'm just going to record a little bit. Go forward, go up, histogram looking good, everything is looking really good, I have it in line of sight, it's really stable, it's really good. Now a couple of things, if I just click on the screen and leave my finger on the screen, I can now go to the right and to the left. And it's limited, but it's still not bad. I can also tilt up and down without having to use the dial. Sometimes this is a little bit easier than just doing it with the, with a the wheel. So I'm going to stop recording the video. I'm going to go back here to these three dots. And I'm going to go to control and button customization because I want to set this one here, the 5D, so that if I go to the mid, it's going to reset the gimbal. And now all I have to do is click on there and it should recenter the gimbal. And there you have it. So the batteries last a long time. You can see here how it has 35 uh, minutes and 47 seconds. And again, if I go to say the 7X camera, I can go to my camera settings, set my settings a little bit differently. I'm going to go back to 30 frames per second. Normal is fine, we already knew that. So now look at the autofocus. I can simply focus by clicking or I can just go to the manual focus and now I see the peak controls. So everything that has a red outline is actually in focus. I'll switch to the 3X camera and you can see already everything is in focus. I'm gonna go in here and change the shutter to something even faster because I can't control the aperture and you can see it in here beautiful of course 30 frames per second d log because I can't do anything other than than that other than that and normal and of course HDR which I don't want to do right now so I'm going to come down and back Eventually, I'm going to have another video in which uh, I'll show you some cool shots and all of that. This is simply about the settings. And finally, let's switch to the 1X camera. And there you have it. The histogram looks good. Everything looks good. I'm just going to record a little bit there. And I have the wheel set to control the aperture here. I can simply go to my camera settings and I know the ISO is at 400. I actually want to check to see how grainy this is. And uh, I can change the aperture by using my, my wheel, my right wheel. And I have that set up on the controls here. So on, on the control button customization, 
I have the wheel, the right dial set to adjust aperture. Uh, we're going to move on to the computer now. So uh, I'll stop recording. Let me go to the 3x. And this one should be in D log. Yes, D log M. I'm going to actually go up a little bit because I want to get some of the sky. And I want to record a little bit of that only so that you see the difference. That's good. Notice I still have 31 minutes left of battery, 77%. That's amazing. I'll stop recording. And now let's go to the 7X. And there you have it. I'm going to change this a little bit. Let me go actually to the settings first. 30 frames per second is good. Normal, so we already know that, uh, that we can't have D-log. So let's go up so we can see the sky. You can see a little bit of the zebra lines, but no colors. They're not being crushed because look at the histogram, right? Let's put this gimbal up a little bit. And now let's try to close this a little bit and it won't let me. So maybe I'll go to a faster shutter speed. And we're going at 30 frames per second. So the shutter speed should be a multiple of that. So 120 is good. And let's record there. Look at the histogram. And we are good. I'll get rid of the camera settings. And you can see the peaking thresholds in there. Perfect. Just doing a slow pan. And there you have it. All right, I'm going to stop recording and we'll compare those three uh, in Premiere Pro in the computer. So let's do it. And now we're back in the studio. I already created a Premiere Pro project. I imported three files, one from the 1X camera, one from the 3X, and one from the 7X. Let's see how they look. You can see the sequence right here. This is the 1X, this is the 3X, and this is the 7X. And I think I'm going to make the 3X and the 7X a little bit bigger. Or actually, you know what, I'm going to change the sequence settings to be 3840 by 2160. That way our clips uh, will fit. Because the, the one from the 1X was taken at true 4K and the other ones are Ultra HD. So the difference is very minimal, but it's still, I mean, you could see the, the pillar bars on the sides. So, you know, might as well fix it. All right, here on the left, I'm going to show the scopes. And here is the program uh, panel. So this is what the clips look like. I already trimmed them a little bit. And uh, so this is the 1X, the 3X, and the 7X. And I can tell you already, without doing a lick of correction, that uh, I'm not liking the colors of the 7X. So here we go. I'm going to fix this a little bit. And this is not a lesson in color correction. I just want you to see the difference after they have been processed. So I'm going to go to curves and looking at my scopes here, I'm going to lower the darks until the signal just goes a little bit low like yay. I'm going to bring the, the whites, the brights up to about yay. I will adjust the darks a little bit more. And I'm going to zoom in because I'm going to scrub this just to make sure there are no surprises. And now, I mean, I didn't even move or nothing. So this is, this is all good. Now I'm going to look at my vector scope and I think I can bring the saturation up a little bit. And that's pretty good. And the white balance is correct as well. I just wanna go a little bit more to the curves. So I'm gonna go to the hue and saturation curves. I'm going to select that sky and maybe bring the saturation up a tiny little bit. And I'm going to go to Hue versus Luma as well. I'll select that color and then br maybe bring the Luma down 
I'm not enjoying that one bit, so I'm not going to do that. So all I did was bring the saturation up. And this is the colors from the 1X. This is now the 3X, a little bit darker. So I'm going to leave the darks as they are. I'm just going to bring the brights up. And I will also bring the saturation uh, up a little bit. And you know what? They compare very favorably. So I'm pretty good with both of these. They match pretty well. So I can see me using both the 1X and the 3X. This is the 7X and uh, just looking at it. I mean, I know that, you know, the colors are off a little bit. I'm going to change the white balance a tad. I'm going to scrub this. Let me see if there's anything white that I can use for um, color correction. Uh, let me go to 100%. I see a blue water tower. Uh, I guess I see some white things there in the distance. I guess that's white. That's like a door for something. And now I'm just going to go. It, it's a little bit better. It's a tiny little bit better, but not uh, not a heck of a lot. Uh, so, okay, let's go to the curves, and I'm going to adjust the darks. It's just very contrasting, you know? Uh, I, I don't know, it looks harsh. And that's about it. So, this is the 1X. That looks good. This is the 3X. That also looks good. And this is the 7X. And I'm going to have to do more trying, uh, but I'm not super happy about that one. Okay, let's see if we get any graininess out of this. So I want to check like the road and the roof and all of that. Uh, so remember, this ISO was set at 400 and we couldn't change it. So 400. And I'm going to zoom in to 100%. And now I'm just going to move to different parts just to see if I see any graininess in here that would show up in the road. You know, I see some. I do see some. I see it right on the road, a little bit of graininess. I don't think it's enough for me not to use it. And I got to tell you, for a video camera, it's pretty good. Uh, you can't compare it with a still. A, a still camera, I mean, you can put the ISO really, really high, and it wouldn't really make a visible difference. But video cameras are a little bit different. Uh, with this one, I can see some graininess, but not enough for me to be prevented from using uh, the, the logarithmic color space. So I think I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty happy with the X1 camera. I'm pretty happy with the X3 camera. The X7 is going to need more testing. It's going to need a lot more testing because right now I'm not really thrilled about it. I'm not really thrilled with the quality of the image. I'm not thrilled with uh, the colors. So, you know, we shall see. I'm going to keep on experimenting. All right, I hope you found this useful. If you did, please hit like, hit subscribe, and thank you for watching. I really thank you, and I'll see you next time.